Okay, hello everyone and welcome back. I'm Taufik and this is another installment of Friday Hacks. Hope that everyone's uh, midterm was okay. Um, first off, uh, we are going to have Ifim, who is a Global Data Center Lead from HREFs. And uh, today he's going to talk about how HREFs saved $400 million in three years by not going to the cloud. So everybody, let's give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Efim Mirochnik. Uh, let's, let's talk about how we can save hundreds of millions of dollars by avoiding cloud, which may seem very unnatural and unusual. Uh, short introduction, my name is Efim. I work in HRFs uh, for about two years. I'm in Singapore for about six years. I worked before in uh, Yandex, uh, Lazada, before Alibaba and after Alibaba, Acronis. So in those companies, I uh, supported delivering uh, data center projects all across the world, in all continents, uh, apart from Antarctica, I believe. Uh, so HFs. Uh, HFs is the company which is headquartered in Singapore uh, for more than 10 years. We are not so big. Uh, with more than 100 people in total. Most of people are uh, remote and we, we keep uh, like our office pretty, pretty spacious. It's a lot of space there uh, and a lot of light. Half of the company are engineers. Uh, so we, we believe that we are a very uh, engineering company. What, what we do, we crawl internet, which means that we collect information from uh, most publicly available sites in the internet, we process data, we store it, and we provide some metrics which should be very, uh, very useful for marketers, for site engine optimization specialists, and for anybody who has a website to understand what is the traffic, what is uh, the position in search engines, and make it better comparing with your competitors. That's our uh, bread and butter, where we earn money. The second part is our uh, project search engine, yep.com, uh, where we hope it will mature and compete with uh, big guys. So, uh, as I said, we crawl the internet, so we go to the sites, we collect a lot of data, we collect this data and push them into our infrastructure to process, to answer queries and uh, provide info that we are asked. Uh, and for that, we uh, keep quite, quite extensive infrastructure. So we have uh, more than 3,000 servers we have uh, a lot of storage in very uh, in kind of very expensive uh, SSD drives. We keep uh, our crawler quite active in the in the world, so only uh, Bing and uh, Google are above us. And our crawler collects five million uh, pages per minute, so it's it's a lot, uh, and we need to keep keep all this in some infrastructure. So this talk is about collocation versus uh, cloud comparison. Uh, collocation is the place where a data center provider, data center is somewhere that provides you guaranteed electricity, guaranteed cooling, uh, security, uh, and you can keep your servers safe there. So you can rely that servers will be up and working there. Cloud provides you not only this, cloud provides you much more services apart from collocation plus the instances that you can take instantly uh, and use them. So I believe you should know about uh, the cloud. Uh, cloud is uh, faster, more flexible usually. Uh, it's readily available to, to use. So if you want to try something, you just create an account and most likely in most of the clouds you will get some free uh, credit that you can use and run your software. Collocations are a bit different. They are a bit uh, older. They uh, have, uh, you need to prepare your infrastructure, you need to buy it. It can be much more customizable for you. 
uh, but it's it's difficult. So the usual trend is to go to the cloud. Why we didn't do this? Uh, I will show you just the next. So we uh, decided to compare how much can be some premium. So those services from clouds, they should come with some premium. So we, we need to compare this. How? Uh, here in Singapore, uh, HLFs has a data center. Data center which consists of 850 servers, which are all mostly the same, uh, with the same specs. So those are the specs for those servers. Uh, they were like top, top tiered. Uh, AMD uh, CPUs from uh, ROM and Milan generations, just previous generations, 2 terabytes of RAM per server, uh, a lot of disks, 15 uh, terabyte disks, in different qu uh, quantities around 16 drives per server, plus uh, 2 by 100 GB. So those are quite powerful servers, trust me. Um, we had, uh, we we have, we still have 850 of those. Uh, calculation here was done for October, uh, November 2022, about a year ago. So all the calculations relate back to that period, uh, and they are based on one uh, one month of usage. So monthly cost of our server was. Uh, a bit more than 1,000 US dollars per month. From this, you can imagine that uh, five years, 12 months uh, per year, multiplied by 60, would cost each server would cost us 60,000 US dollars over the period of five years, just the server with components. When we have a collocation, we need to pay uh, some other fees as well. We need to pay for data center rent, we need to pay for electricity, we need to pay for internet service provider services. We buy the transit, we, uh, we are connected to Equinix Internet Exchange here in Singapore. We uh, buy dark fiber between our data center and uh, Equinix. Uh, plus we uh, have to have our internal network in the data center. So all these things combined uh, cost us $500 per month. In total, $1,500 USD per month per one server. Then uh, we went to compare this with AWS. First thing that AWS doesn't have, or at least didn't have it uh, less than a year ago, didn't have such powerful servers. Just You cannot have them. Uh, the solution was just to find a server which is similar, uh, just, just twice, twice less. So uh, that was the instance in R6i.metal, uh, twice less uh, virtual CPUs, twice less memory, uh, some amount of drives. Uh, plus we, we, have, we, we need to have two such servers to replace one hour server. To, um, to get the cheapest price from Amazon, we can go and just not select on demand, but select uh, three-year reserved instance. It means that you pay, uh, you just commit for three years and pay like you pay rent for three years. And again, to make it cheaper, we selected to pay all upfront. So it's like buying a server, but you go to Amazon, you pay uh, all this money, you never can like retire this server. So three years, you start there, you continue using it. Um, this is the cheapest price that we have in Amazon for, for such instance. The next thing, storage. So storage is very, very different. Storage is very important for us. We use very fast storage. Um, uh, it's not possible to get the same in AWS. Uh, we, we selected uh, elastic block storage uh, and decided to compare it only by capacity. So we ignored IOPSIS. This is the measure of uh, speed that you get from, from the drives. We just ignored it. So technically, this is the lowest part that, uh, that can be there. Network, network is a bit difficult to compare. When, when you hear about a network in the cloud, it's uh, based on data transfer. When you buy it from IP transit providers, it's bandwidth. So it's a bit different approach. To compare it here, we checked what was our network consumption in that month and 
converted it into uh, tra transfer data. Then combine it all together, uh, we, uh, we have the cost. So for us, the biggest cost would be the cost of the storage, even if that storage was like the cheapest we, we could get. Uh, EC2, like the server itself cost, was $5,000 a month, and data uh, transfer data was like the cheapest. It was only 3% of the total monthly cost. Overall, still, uh, the same thing bought from AWS would cost us $17,000 per month. Uh, we had that data center uh, from 2020. So by the time that we compared, we ran it for uh, 30 months, like two and a half uh, years. If we uh, look at that numbers uh, and compare them, so just first comparison is just one to one, one server to one server. We can see that our usual rack, so what we pay for our usual rack of 20 servers will be converted into just two servers in AWS, if we would just pay it. So that's, that's kind of equivalent. If we compare uh, the total money that we would, that we actually paid, so one side is what we paid actually, and that was uh, for two and a half years, it was close to $40 million. If we would pay the same by the prices of monthly cost, the cheapest ones in AWS, that would cost us $440 million USD. Same period, roughly the same hardware. So the comparison and what we saved, as it was in the title, it was around $400 million over those three years, since 2020 till the end of 2022. Uh, maybe, maybe we can afford, maybe we earn a lot and we can afford so, paying so much. Actually, uh, HDFs is, uh, is a private company. H so HDFs doesn't publish its uh, earnings, or at least doesn't have to publish. But HDFs is... Uh, participating in uh, top growing, uh, fastest growing companies in Singapore. So in the last, I believe, four years we are there on some places. And one of the things that uh, are visible from straight times uh, view, I'm not sure that you can see it, even I cannot. But you can go to straight times, find it there, and you will see earnings, uh, like revenue, revenue of HRFs over, uh, over the years. So in 2020, we were below 100 million Singapore dollars. In 2021, we were a bit above. There were no published information about 2022, but we could extrapolate it just linearly and see that it will be a bit more than 100 USD. So in total, like combined years, revenue for HRFs would be $250 million. Coming back and comparing this to uh, 400 47 million that we will pay for AWS for just one data center, and we have more. Uh, it's obvious that we would go bankrupt and we would not be able to sustain while we did pretty well, I believe. Um, so, uh, coming to more or less the end, uh, saving, uh, saving with your own infrastructure provides a lot of, a lot of saving which which i showed we uh we would not be able to survive uh, living completely uh, in aws so for us it's the way to continue working and for me getting my salary uh, the other thing we can better utilize our hardware it means that we do not need to split uh, our software to fit into smaller parts uh, like it would be necessary with AWS. So we spend less, uh, less efforts to squeeze into smaller instances. We can, we can be more, uh, like we can use our resources freely. Also, we publish our updates monthly, sometimes even weekly. So we develop fast and we bring new features. So we concentrate on delivering something new, not into uh, savings in uh, AWS as it would, as it would be uh, the case in the other, as it may, may have been the case. Yep. Um,
I think that's that's mostly it. Pretty short. Uh, I'm ready to answer the questions. Are we using uh, virtualization and uh, containers? Most likely, uh, not most likely. So mostly no. We use some containers for development, but everything else is bare metal. How do you manage deployment? How do you automate deployment? We have Puppet for managing configurations. Uh, we have Ansible for like some initial parts. Uh, luckily, luckily, we uh, we are more or less distributed across the world, so we have more or less constant load. Uh, but some places are indeed more loaded, so for those we have more uh, like more hardware to support those spikes. How do you calculate the amount of uh, the manpower that goes into maintaining the infrastructure? Thank you for the question. Uh, that's 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 a great question and what we have. So technically we have not only collocation, so we have several collocations, we have hosting. So hosting is something in between where uh, the servers are provided to you by by service provider, but everything above the server is on you. And we have cloud, we have AWS as well. So all these things all like all different things are managed by by a group of less than 10 people uh, so we have all different stuff and we manage it all together we we try uh, to use tools which are universal we avoid or at least we we try to avoid some uh, very like vendor locking services proprietary services like AWS, we do use RDS, which is relational database system from uh, from AWS, but technically nothing else. So we don't go into some proprietary fancy things like S3. We don't use it, uh, and it allows us to to move out at least potentially. So since we have it uh, the same. Oh, more or less the same. Our approach is the same, so it, it gives us ability to 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 handle it easier. And uh, if we are talking about people, so that that comparison was about 850 servers. Suppose suppose we need to add more people. That was the question that was asked like everywhere. Like people are not in your calculation, and uh, that that will ruin everything. I will try to switch. Yep. So let's let's go proof by contradiction. Let's hire 100 people, whoever you want. Uh, network operating system, uh, network operation center, SOC, uh, system architects, developers, uh, HR to hire these guys, managers, whatever. 100 people. Let's give them salary of 500 thousand uh, dollars per year. It's pretty decent salary, uh, <laughs> even for California, even for quite big companies. But let's say it's an average salary. So those 100 people, uh, very high salary, and we have uh, and we are paying them all the time. So yes, for each one, each one 500 thousand. Yeah, we we are generous. <laughs> Let's do. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so in total, it's imaginary experiment. So, in total, we would need to pay fifty million per year, right? So, over uh, two and a half years that we have this uh, data center, we would have uh, to pay one hundred twenty-five million. So, just fifty million by two point five. Let's let's add it to all those numbers. So our whole infrastructure in this data center cost us 40 million plus 125. It would give us 165 million dollars for everything, 
with all those people. And technically, we can put one person in front and in the back of each rack. So it's, it's a lot. Uh, and still, it will be like three times cheaper than, than, than AWS. So when, when we pay premium for AWS, we should know how, how much is this premium. And that was actually the purpose of this exercise. Uh, for me, AWS is kind of a medical drug, a medicine. So if you use it in some reasonable quantities, it's very useful. When you understand how to use it, use it small, uh, it's very convenient and nice to, to have. But if you rely on it as a whole, it's like medicine. It will not make you any good if you take the whole bottle. It will damage you. How do you manage the time difference? Like one day I decide I need new server, so I can you know AWS takes this much time, and you know I put my own server. So what is what is the time difference for getting new servers to the system? It depends. It depends on the time. Uh, it depends on on the situation. Some so if you go for something usual in the middle uh, or like cheap and uh, most outdated, AWS is where, where you can go and you will get it like any time. It will always be there. If you need something that uh, that is new, that's where AWS cannot help you. So as, as you saw, they just don't have those powerful configurations. Uh, even like three months ago, just trying to get something with GPUs for, uh, for machine learning artificial intelligence, would be quite difficult. I was trying to do this. We had this in the data center, in our data center, for like almost two years, and it was pretty scarce supply in, in AWS. So it, it depends. For usual things, uh, cloud is very fast. For something not so usual, it's uh, it's difficult. If you order something, when you go to, go and order some servers, uh, they so you will discuss the timeline. Usual timeline is like six to eight weeks when nothing breaks, when we don't have COVID and supply chain constraints. So eight weeks kind of good for something usual. If it's again something newer, it will be like three, four months. It depends. Thank you. So what's the break even like AWS versus your own server? Like where do you choose AWS versus because I'm sure AWS has a business out there. Of course. We have quite big infrastructure. So for us, as you saw, for us, very important are those drives, SSD drives, and they consist the biggest part of the cost for AWS. Oops. Um, I believe for smaller projects, uh, it's very easy and fast and go there into AWS. Uh, I would recommend to go first to the hosting because if you have startup or something that is going to grow, it's better to go and have something that can that will be similar. Most likely going into AWS, you will start at some point, you grow, you will start optimizing it, you will start to use proprietary tools or services from AWS specifically for that. Then you have vendor lock, and you stay there while, while you grow. Uh, hosting allows you to move easier, so it provides less, less services, but at least you can move into like, both sides. So you can go to the cloud, you can go into like, collocation, whatever you want. Or you can, you can have hybrid, but if you grow big, at some point uh, you have a lot of data to process. And at that point, data gravity doesn't matter. So you need to move the data and process them somehow. And moving something out of the cloud is expensive because they, they, it costs money. So uh, it really depends on service, on how you're going to use it. It can be very cheap as well. I mean, for some small things where you do not utilize those uh, powerful CPUs, it's pretty much okay. Uh, 
Yes, we, we have a lot of data just to illustrate. Um, so we, we started a new data center in the US this year and it took several weeks to copy those tens of petabytes from this data center to the other data center while we, we had like 200 gigabit links. Uh, so they were like very, very used for, for weeks just to copy data. From, the, from Singapore to the US. You mean yep.com? Yes, and hopefully it will become better. It becomes better, it's already better, but it's still not mature. Yes. The idea of this search engine is to share profit, uh, share profit with the creators. So uh, idea of uh, Google and Bing is to share, uh, to show you advertisement and uh, get money from that advertisement. Uh, and as a creator of, of the site, so where people come, you don't get much. So you, you should put your uh, advertisement on the site as well, or you can provide, you can sell some other services. Idea of this search engine is to share this profit. It's still a very early stage. Hopefully, it will work, but not not much to say about it. Um, you mentioned that uh, uh, AWS services or proprietary tools kind of lock the customer in and subsequently the competitors out. Does Ahrefs have a similar strategy so that? You know, people don't just keep joining HRFs and then, oh, this competitor charges me $2 less, so it's okay. <laughs> well, we're talking about buying and selling. Uh, those are different parts. Uh, they, they mean that not just because you charge me $2 more or $2 less, it's not, it's not the price thing, it's what it's something that you uh, have above and beyond just the dollar value. I, I believe that those services is not just just getting money and uh, getting you locked in. They provide a lot of a lot of things that make your life much easier. So you don't think about a lot of things. The point is that those are not very much standardized. So if you want to go somewhere else, it will be different. It will um, so you will need to change a lot of things, I believe, to, to move from AWS to like Google Cloud or Azure or Ali Cloud, so they, they're just different. Some things may be similar, some, some will take your efforts to like, change them. Uh, there, are, there are tools that allow you to live in different, in different clouds and they like, try to keep you away from those different things. I mean, Terraform, some that, that that's a tool that allows you to keep your infrastructure like more or less uniformly uh, supported and it works with different clouds. So th th there is something to make it uh, simpler for you. But So simpler means that you like it, you will use it, that's good, but you will pay. <laughs> Uh, hi, so I just have two questions. Um, do you think your cost savings are kind of like unique to your company's use case? Because to me, it seems like the main bottleneck in terms of cost was the storage cost difference between co location and the right? So I'm just wondering, do you, you probably see like other businesses, competitors, like how do you think this to them? And also, I noticed that HS uses OCaml a lot, so I just wanted to ask uh, in my opinion. I'm sorry, what the second question, can you please repeat it? Uh, OCaml, the functional programming language. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's why I asked why we trust to use it. Oh, uh, why? Yeah. <laughs> okay, first question about uh, like how universal is the, this, this uh, comparison. No, it is not universal, it's only for us, for this specific data center. Uh, 
Uh, I had some like wider calculations. Uh, it still shows uh, much, much more uh, expensive infrastructure in the cloud for much more usual servers, like older ones, cheaper ones, not, not so, not, not like this. Uh, I would say that it should, it should depend on what company has and uh, how to like go in, in comparing something very specific per each company. But making this uh, per one month per some specific configuration allows you to see uh, what, what is your situation. In some other company, like one, one of those listed there, we did such exercise some time ago, uh, like years ago, and comparison there was like three to four times. And the idea uh, to use AWS was that we have our own infrastructure that is cheaper, but we keep some something smaller in like some some cloud. And if uh, there is a disaster, like disaster recovery, so we can start whatever we need. We will pay more, but at least uh, service will go on. Uh, so that's like some dedicated usage and specific usage for, for the cloud that we consider. So here it was much, much more expensive than even like I remember it was there. Why OCaml? I cannot answer. Uh, I, we have a lot of in OCaml and uh, people uh, like it very much, but I am not competent to, to answer this question, unfortunately. So there are a lot of guys that will talk and I believe they come here to talk uh, about OCaml as well, I am not one of those. Uh, just a quick question. What do you think is the hardest challenge to actually migrate from AWS to your uh, own infrastructure? You will need to change the approach significantly. So it will be it will be an organizational process in the company. So you will need to have procurement. You will need to talk to different vendors. It's not just one vendor that you have and one bill. Uh, you will need to like know the process. So that's why I think that first step would be to try to go into hosting. It's easier. It's much more similar to the cloud, but it's a bit lower level. So servers will be provided to you from this one vendor. Uh, network will be managed. Data center will be there. So a lot of things will be provided from from that provider. You will understand how to deal with the servers, like physical servers. They will fail. Uh, there will be some hardware issues, but those are not so... It's not such a big obstacle as it may seem. So, like, uh, we, we have statistics about, uh, hard, uh, about SSD, SSD drives. So, annual failure rate for the drives is below 1%. So, if you have 1,000 drives, you may consider that around 10 drives will fail over the year. So, well, okay, one drive per month, it's not, not, not a big deal. So, power supply units will fail, RAM will fail. So, as you grow, as you have like thousands of servers, it, it will become something to deal with. But it's not, not something extraordinary. Uh, from company point of view, uh, it will require uh, signing, signing agreements, negotiating those agreements. Uh, if we go to collocation, so you need to take care of our data center, uh, uh, internet service providers, you most likely will want to have several of them. So for each of those things, you may want to have uh, a bidding process. So you need to ask prices, you need to select somehow, you need to make uh, agreements, and that's, that's a painful process. But once it's in place, it's, it's okay, it's just, just a routine. So you, you can go there. One more question. Is data durability and high availability of concern? Like uh, on AWS, EBS has a redundant storage. So they have multiple copies for each uh, gigabyte price. Yes, sure. We, we have it as well. Um, so uh, 
We have uh, several copies of data now. We have even more, so we have them over like those data centers. So opening a new data center was uh, in particular to have to have it not not in one place. So we grow, we can spend some more money, we become more resilient, and we prepare for redundancy. Uh, yes. So for in that calculation uh, where I calculated EPS, so I didn't calculate that we uh, need to have the same storage it was reduced so it was reduced to have to consider that this redundancy is already there on EBS side any other question what factors do you usually consider while deciding the locations of your data centers um, for this company or for the previous companies? It's very different. Uh, the point is that uh, what is the strategy? So data center is, uh, is a massive investment for a long time. And it really, really, really depends on, uh, on many things. Uh, one company wanted to have presence in uh, multiple countries. So for that, uh, and that's supposed to be done very fast. So for that, we went into multiple countries, just, just sent a request, got proposals, and based on some criteria, we decided if we go with this data center or not. For this company here, uh, we uh, compared the prices of electricity here in Singapore. You know it's not the cheapest place in the world. Uh, so the prices in the US, uh, so selecting the last data center in the US, it was selected to be in uh, Virginia, in Ashburn. Uh, that's kind of the center of internet, to be honest. So that's that's the place where like, a lot a lot of data centers and everything is concentrated there. All uh, like top uh, internet providers are there, so it's very easy to connect to to everyone. So that was the first thing. The second thing was that. Uh, it was uh, cheap enough, so electricity was cheap there, uh, much cheaper than in Singapore, and we spent a lot on electricity. That was the second thing, and uh, the last one was that this data center can serve customers both in, in the US, and uh, it's not so far from Europe, so we decided to go into this data center, which is serving both parts. Okay, I think we can take one last question. Thank you very much, Thank you for the question. Yeah. All right, welcome back. Um, next up, we have Kieran, who is a PhD student in NUS, and he's part of the programming language research team. And for his talk today, he's going to talk about what can programming language research do for you from the perspective of a hacker. So let's give him a, walk, a round of applause. Okay, should I uh, start? Yes. All right, okay. Awesome. Uh, I'm so glad everyone could make it here today. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, what programming languages research can do uh, for you. Or more broadly, the title of this talk is something closer to uh, Don't Ask what you can do for programming languages research, but ask instead what programming languages research can do uh, for you. So uh, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, but before we begin, let me just take a brief interlude to introduce myself. So who exactly am I? Well, uh, hi, I'm Kieran. I'm a PhD student here at NUS. And most importantly, uh, and crucially, I am a hacker. So uh, I love playing and tinkering with things and building cool projects uh, with my friends. So these are a sort of number of various little uh, things that I've built over the past. And speaking of friends, here at NUS, I work at uh, VersLab, which is one of NUS's programming languages and software engineering research groups. Um, so this is a group photo that we took. Here I am, right there. Um, and what we do is we investigate how we can use the techniques of programming languages to build verified software that is guaranteed to be correct and thereby produce, uh, make the world a better place for everyone. So uh, that, that's kind of the pitch. 
Um, and the reason that I'm here today is because uh, I think that you all can benefit uh, from doing programming languages research. I think you all have something to contribute uh, to working in programming languages research. And um, the rest of this talk is just going to be me trying to convince you of that. Um, so uh, without further ado, let's get started. So why exactly should you do PL research? Uh, well, there's many reasons. So where do I start? But if I had to choose, then I'd say the coolest things about programming languages research, I'd say are the following. The first thing is programming languages research is fun. Uh, you get to work on new and exciting technologies and build cool things. Secondly, programming languages research can give you recognition for the effort and time you put into building cool things. And finally, programming languages research can have real impacts. So you can build t uh, software and editors that, are, that influence and impact the lives of many people and make their uh, lives easier. So in the rest of this talk, I'm going, to give, uh, I'm going to justify these points by giving an example of various projects that we've done at VerseLab that I think emblemize each one of these points. Um, so with regards to why programming language research is fun, we're going to look at building a game in Rhombus, which is an experimental programming language uh, uh, that involves macros. Uh, to investigate recognition, we're going to look at correcting bad mathematics uh, in using sort of the technique of computer proofs from programming languages research. And uh, just as a note, so this bad mathematics is not just mathematics that is, uh, that, that is so widespread that's been repeated in so many papers, but not only in many papers, it's also been repeated in textbooks uh, like this uh, probability and computing book. So if you're interested, come and talk to me uh, after, the, after the talk. Um, uh, that, that's actually used by courses here at NUS and all around the world. So uh, there was a sort of statement in there that was wrong. and we, we managed to identify and correct and verify the true value. Uh, and finally, for impact, we're going to look at building uh, PL tools used by developers. We're going to look at building editors uh, for very hot programming languages used by sort of very large, uh, by many, many countless developers uh, at large companies like RFs or Jane Street and so on and so forth. Okay, so that's the kind of high level outline of my talk and let's uh, get started. So let's look at the first point. Um, why is programming languages fun? Uh, well, we're gonna justify this by looking at a case study where we built a game with Rhombus. So Rhombus is a experimental prototype language uh, in created by the developers who maintain the Lisp, um, the Racket Lisp programming language, if you've heard of it. Um, and this programming Racket is kind of very popular within academia. It's used by a lot of courses, but it also has a very strong research bent. And the latest development of the Racket team is to construct this rhombus uh, language, which kind of explores the design space of programming languages looking at how we can use macros. So you may have heard of macros from programming languages like Lisp. Uh, these are the kind of idea of having programs that can generate programs, allowing for sort of a customizable uh, programming language. Uh, but if you have heard of Lisp, then you know that sometimes Lisp can, can be kind of ugly. It has a lot of parentheses and can be very overwhelming to look at all of these. Um, and so the question that Rhombus asks is, hey, can we have the sort of uh, expressivity and the computational power of something like Lisp while having the ease of use and ergonomics of a sort of natural programming language like Python. And when we saw this, we were just so excited by the prospects of Rhombus, we took it and used it to build a game uh, engine. And not only a game engine, we used that to implement a game. And the game uh, looks like this. So, uh, you know, it looks, it doesn't look that bad. It looks kind of fun. Um, so that's what we've done. Let me tell you about it. Um, Okay, so building a game with Rhombus. Why exactly did we think that building things in Rhombus would be fun? Well, in order to understand this, we need to first understand why exactly you'd want to use macros, because Rhombus is all about the power of macros. And to understand macros, let's look at how you might program without macros, which is kind of painful. So let's take a sort of programming language, just choose a random one, let's choose Python. And here I have a sort of factorial function implemented in Python. Uh, so the function factorial takes as parameter this argument n, um, and then it branches on the value of n. So it first checks if n is zero, then it returns one. If it's one, then it returns one, and otherwise it returns n times factorial of n minus one. So this is a sort of fairly uncontroversial uh, definition of factorial. 
And finally, the program ends by calling fact, uh, factorial on three um, and returning its result. So, in, uh, so, so then the typical process of using this is we take this program and pass it to a Python compiler and executor, and this would run the program and produce the result of six, so as we'd expect. Um, now, if you're interested in programming languages, then you know that actually this isn't the full story. So a compiler isn't just sort of this black box. It's actually composed in a slight, uh, sequence of layers. So the actual pipeline kind of looks something closer to this, which is slightly less pretty. But the high-level idea is that the program is taken. Then it's first passed, uh, it's taken as input as a string. And then it's first passed into a lexer, which kind of res restores some structure from this raw flat string by splitting the string into a sequence of sort of words, or these are called tokens. Uh, these tokens are then fed into a parser, which then sort of extracts the tree-like structure within the program. Um, and this tree-like structure, this is the AST, if you're familiar, uh, will then be compiled into an executable program that Python can then run and produce a final result. So uh, this, this is fine. This is how programs work. Uh, but now let's say you look at this program and you realize, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't quite express what I want in the most idiomatic way. Uh, you might say, well, if and else isn't really what I want. I, I really think my function could be better defined using some kind of match statement, right? Well, how would we rewrite this program using a match statement? Well, the problem is in a language like Python, if you want to add a match statement, then you need to essentially change all these internal details of the compiler. You need to change how it's lexed, you need to change how it's parsed, and how it's compiled. So that's really a problem. And essentially, you have to wait for the language developers to come in and make this change. And thankfully, in the case of Python, uh, in Python 3.10, they realized their faults, and they said, hey, let's add match statements. So after Python uh, 10, uh, we could then rewrite our program like this. So now factorial uh, does starts by uh, doing a match on the value of n. And then in the case where n is 0, it returns 1. In the case where n is 1, it returns 1. And otherwise, it returns n times factorial of n minus 1. So this is kind of a fairly, it's not a significant change, but you could argue that it makes it slightly clearer and easier to read this program. Uh, the only problem is, in order to implement this change, we had to wait for the language developers to actually make this change. And if you've known the history of Python, you know that Python has not had match statements for sort of a decade. So if you're happy with waiting a decade, then Python is for you. Um, <laughs> but the kind of... So, so, so actually, this, this problem of having to wait, having a static language that you can't change has, has been known for a long time. And it's, in some ways, been solved uh, previously. So this kind of problem doesn't exist in a language like macros. And sort of the classical example of this is a language like Lisp. So let's look at defining factorial in Lisp. Uh, here I have the same factorial function uh, defined in Lisp. And you can see there's a lot of parentheses. But the idea is roughly the same. We start with this cond form, which is essentially the same as this if-else thing. And it sort of evaluates each one of these branch conditions and it returns the result of the first one that's true. So first it checks if n is 0, and in which case it returns 1. If n is 1, it returns 1. And otherwise, it returns n times factorial of n minus 1. Um, so this is fairly straightforward. And the way that this is executed in the compiler is roughly the same. So we take the program, we pass it into the lexer. The lexer kind of splits this program into a sequence of tokens. And then the uh, program is parsed into an AST. And one of the key features of Lisp is that because the syntax is fairly regular, everything it consists of sequences of uh, well-nested parentheses, this can be done in a fairly uh, automatic way, a uh, uh, quite uh, regular way. And finally, this, can be, this AST then can then be compiled into code that can be executed, and we can get a result as we'd expect. So pretty simple. Now let's look at the problem of rewriting this in a slightly more ergonomic form with a match statement. Well, in a programming language like Lisp, that's not a problem at all. So what we can do is we can write a macro. So this, this is an example of a macro. A macro is essentially a program that, that runs at compile time and that transforms the user's input. So this macro consists of two parts. We have this pattern that kind of matches input statements in our uh, syntax. And we have the result of what it should be transformed into. So the pattern says whenever you see an expression that kind of looks like a match, followed by an expression, and then a sequence of cases, these are what these dot, dot, dots represent, then the programming language, the compiler, should transform it into a cond form where you're asserting the equality of the expression with the corresponding value. 
Um, and so now, if we take this fact, uh, with, with this macro, we can rewrite factorial in terms of match, as we've seen with Python, but this time in Lisp. And now, if we take this program and pair it with the corresponding macro, we can pass it into the compiler. So the program first gets lexed, as before, uh, and then the, the, the sequence of tokens is passed into the parser and converted into an AST. But at this point, when the, uh, the compiler runs into an invocation of a macro, the macros can then uh, run and change and transform the input uh, syntax. So in this case, this macro will run and transform our definition of match into a version that uses cond, uh, using the transformation rule that I just described on the previous slide. And in this way, we can convert our program into a form, a simpler form, that can be understood by the compiler and evaluated, uh, compiled and evaluated into the final result. Okay, so this problem of sort of a static language that you can't change isn't really a problem. It's been solved by Lisp, so what's the big deal? Well, you know, the elephant in the room, and you may have noticed, is what about all these parentheses, right? They're all over the place. And for a, programming, for a program as simple as sort of factorial, that doesn't really bother you. Um, but if you look at sort of a more complicated Lisp program with more nesting, uh, these slides are actually written in Racket, so if you're interested, come and talk to me after the talk, and I can show you uh, what real parentheses hell looks like. Um, <laughs> Uh, then, then this really becomes an uh, sort of uh, overhead in your head, overhead uh, when you're trying to program because you have to deal with all these parentheses. So the question that you might want to ask as a programming language researcher is, well, can we do any better? And this is exactly what Rhombus aims to answer. So Rhombus is a programming language that has a sort of syntax very similar to Python, um, but it also has support for macros like in Lisp. The high-level idea is Rhombus takes the same sort of pipeline as a normal compiler, but then it imbues it with macros that kind of do the following transformation, which is that macros can take the input and then return a sequence of tokens. And the key thing this, this enables is that macros can kind of run before you have a fully formed parse tree. So you're not restricted by the kind of rigid structure of S expressions. You can have a kind of input that is slightly more flexible like Python. So what exactly does this kind of arrow mean? Um, well, the kind of macro that you could write for a match expression in Rhombus looks like this. So we say that, okay, when you have a sequence of tokens that has this kind of structure, where you have a match, and then there's sort of some indentation and then some cases of this form with the dot, dot, dots, then you can transform it into a sequence of if statements. In this case, when you, pass, when you combine this, you can, uh, you can write your factorial function using matches as you want in a more idiomatic way, but then when the compiler runs over it, it can use the macro to transform it into a more standard form using if-else statements. Um, okay, so for a sort of macro like match, this is kind of trivial. Uh, you might not be particularly impressed by this transformation that I just showed. Um, you know, who cares about changing matches to ifs? But think about sort of more complicated um, macro systems that you might want to introduce. So for example, suppose you wanted to have an alternative to Python's class system, uh, some kind of thing like an entity component system, if you've heard it from games. Uh, essentially, the high-level idea is something different from the way Python does classes with inheritance and such. Uh, or what if you wanted to have some kind of uh, DSL for writing sort of dialogue systems, some kind of thing where you write a piece of text that looks like a human script, but actually corresponds to some kind of data that your, um, that your program can use. And kind of the crucial thing is, these kind of problems occur all over programming, but they also happen to all occur within developing a game. And that's exactly what we did. We took uh, the features of Rhombus and we used it to implement uh, a game uh, using all these DSLs. So just to kind of give you a high level overview, let's, uh, and also the, our, our, um, our experiences from doing this were actually influenced the design of the Rhombus uh, language itself and actually ended up in the Rhombus paper. So the code about, uh, about part of the code of our game actually occurs in this paper, uh, which is going to be published or uh, presented next week. So uh, you should also check it out if you have the time. Uh, but okay, just to show you that this, I'm not just making this up, uh, let's do a quick sort of live demo. Fingers crossed. Here we go. Uh, all right. Okay, so here I have, I'm gonna, it's going to be a little difficult to do this. Uh, but here I have the code for my for the game, and I'm going to run it. So give me a second. Okay. All right. So I'm going to run Racket on the main file, 
And the game is, uh, it loaded. Oh, awesome, okay, so here, here's the game. Uh, you can, you can walk, walk around, uh, so there's a little person. Uh, I didn't get around to putting clothes on him, so apologies for that. Um, but you can walk around. Uh, there's an inventory, so that's nice. Uh, you can, there's a little sort of, you know, you can sort of do a little stab, so this bat tries to hurt you, so uh, you can kind of, okay, this might be it. <laughs> okay, okay, so if you, uh, if you beat the bat, then you can sort of pick up the items, and then they show up in your inventory, so that's pretty cool. And another cool thing is uh, there's a, also a dialogue system in this. So, oh yeah, sure, that'd be great. Perfect. Uh, so there's also a dialogue system. So uh, you can talk to the guard, and the guard uh, sort of speaks, halt, who goes there? Say, oh, I'm a traveler, just passing by. What do you want? And I say, oh, never mind. The guard returns to his position, and the conversation ends. Uh, we can also do, oh, the guard says, good day this time. Say, okay, just one more thing. Uh, what do you want? And I say, oh, I'd like to ask you a question. He says, oh, who are you? Uh, so I say, who are you? You ask about the guard himself. He says, I'm a guard. Okay, could you help me out with something? I say, no. He says, no, you reject the guard's proposition rudely. He says, fine. I knew I shouldn't have brought it up. And then guard mumbles under his breath before returning to his original stature. Move along now. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the, oh, I still have social show. Okay, so that, that's the game. Uh, so hopefully you, you believe me that it is actually a game. And now I'm going to show you the code. Uh, so this, this should be interesting. So th this is kind of the main entry point of the game. It, the, it, what it's doing doesn't really matter, but the point is that this is, this is just vanilla rhombus code. So it has some sort of while constructs, it has some uh, function calls on objects, and so on and so forth. This is vanilla rhombus code. Um, so there's, there should be nothing surprising here. It kind of looks a bit like Python, and that's, that's fine. Uh, but one of, the, one of the cool things about rhombus is that you can, using the macro system, you can embed quite complicated DSLs. So here I'm going to show you also some rom uh, rhombus code. But this is actually rhombus code that embeds the guard dialog that I just showed you. So when you talk to a guard, uh, it actually runs this following sort of script. And this script is all just normal rhombus code, just running through the macros that I defined. So for example, here it says, here's the intro dialog where the guard says, halt, who goes there? Uh, then we have um, sort of then alternatively, the guards can say different things after the first time you've spoken to them. So for example, good day or hello, hello. Uh, then, you know, responses, there's also custom control constructs. So here we can branch uh, and ask the user for an input. And depending on the input, we can choose a different branch uh, position. And there's also sort of non-local jumps. So here we can jump to the end of our program. And so that, that's kind of the most impressive one. But we also have things like uh, custom class systems. So for example, here I have a system. This is kind of um, uh, a component from, it's a sort of idea from entity component systems. The underlying details don't really matter, but the point is that this is, I've implemented essentially an alternative to Rhombus's built-in class system, uh, entirely using macros. So this looks like normal built-in Rhombus code, but it actually runs sort of things that are defined by me. And it intermixes kind of my custom data, or my custom syntax, with sort of vanilla Rhombus code. So the rest of this looks like vanilla Rhombus code, kind of looks a bit like Python. Um, and I think we also have, uh, yes, so if we look at, yes, okay, so for example, and similarly, sort of all of the monsters that we've seen, like the bat, oh, we didn't see the bat, but all of the monsters that we've seen are kind of defined using this uh, custom class-like structs. So this is all vanilla rhombus code, but I've customized it to be a completely uh, unique DSL that's uh, tailor-made for building this kind of game. Uh, okay, so that, that concludes my demo. Thank you for holding. I'll need your help in a bit later. All right. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so uh, live demo didn't fail, so that's good. Now let's move on to the next point. What PL can do for you, number two, and that is recognition. So let's look at correcting bad maths with computer proofs. Um, okay, so why exactly does, you know, why exactly do we need to correct the bad maths in the first place? Well, mathematicians are human, and humans make mistakes. So the question that you might want to ask as a researcher is, well, hey, can we use computers to help in this process? And this is kind of the uh, area of mechanized mathematics. Uh, this is the question that's asked by the area of mechanized mathematics, and which looks at using sort of computer-written proofs to check and verify uh, mathematical statements, mathematical proofs. So what exactly is a computer proof? Well, to understand this, we first need to look at what exactly a proof is. Um, so what exactly is a proof? Well, let's investigate this by looking at a proof. And today we're going to write out the proof for the following statement. So this is the sum of natural numbers from 0 through to n equals uh, n times n plus 1 over 2. 
Now you probably, this is a classic sort of school book um, uh, proof. You've probably seen it before, uh, but I think it would be helpful for us to go through this here. Okay, so let, let, let's try and prove this statement uh, right here on the spot. Okay, um, so how, how do we prove this? Well, you know, if you've seen the proof, then you know the, the way to approach this is we can do induction on the natural number n. So uh, if we do induction on n, then we have two sort of things to prove. We first have to show that this statement holds on the base case when n is zero. And then we need to show that, the, uh, it, that an inductive argument holds. That if we assume that this statement holds for up to n, then we can show that it holds for n plus one. So let's look at proving the base case. Here we need to show that the sum of natural numbers up to n equals n plus one, n times n plus one uh, over two. So uh, expanding the left-hand side, we get the sum of zero to zero is zero, okay? And on the right-hand side, we get zero times zero plus one over two is zero. This is also okay. And so we have the left-hand side equals the right-hand right -hand side, and so we've established that the base case holds. Now let's look at the inductive step now, um, where we need to show that this statement holds for n plus one, sum of natural numbers up to n plus one, equals n plus one times n plus one plus one over two. Um, okay, so how do we do this? Well, the first thing we can do is we can look at this uh, sum from zero to n plus one, and we can split it into two parts. We can split it into the sum from n uh, zero through to n, and the final sum and of n plus one. Now we can observe that this uh, sum of natural numbers from zero through to n is equal exactly to our inductive hypothesis. And so we can use that to transform this, rewrite this expression into the following sort of uh, equality, uh, following expression. And now notice that on, on our left-hand side, we have this, the summation, but the only term that isn't under this denominator of two is the n plus one. So we can just multiply that by two. Um, and then we bring it into the numerator uh, I, 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 under the, uh, over the denominator of two. And now notice that on both sides of our equation, we're dividing by two. So we can sort of simplify that equality by removing it and canceling it out. And now notice that uh, in, on the left-hand side, we have this sum of two terms that are being multiplied by n plus one. So we can factor this out again. And now we get two plus n times n plus one equals n plus one times n plus one plus one. And now notice that both sides of the equality are being multiplied by n plus one. And so we can simplify this. Um, uh, we can sort of simplify the equation and cancel out both sides. And thus we get two plus n equals n plus one plus one. And this by arithmetic is just the same equation on the left and the right. So the left hand side equals the right hand side. And so we've established the inductive step as well. And now with this, we've completed our proof by induction and we can safely establish that this statement holds uh, for all numbers, uh, all, all numbers, right? So, so there you have it. That's kind of a proof of a fact. So what exactly is a proof? Well, a proof is nothing other than sort of an argument for the truth of a statement, in this case, the sum of natural numbers. Um, or more specifically, we can say that a sort of uh, a proof is really a sort of sequence of deductions that establish a property. So I established this equality by reducing each one of these, uh, of these terms into a simplified form. And you may have noticed that each one, of my, each one of my steps in this proof was simple enough that they were uncontroversial. So if we want to produce a sort of good proof, then we can say that a good proof is really something that is a sequence of rigorous deductions. So that they, each one of the individual steps is sort of uncontroversial and you don't have to be sort of an advanced mathematician to grasp it immediately. So what exactly is a computer proof then? Well, a computer proof is nothing other than such a proof, a sequence of rigorous deductions establishing a property, but crucially, one that where each one of these deductions can be checked by a computer. Um, okay, so now uh, to kind of motivate this and establish this, I'm gonna, we're gonna do another live demo, so have fun. Um, and we're gonna, I'm gonna show you live, so pray for me. Um, I'm gonna show you live the uh, a computer proof. So uh, here we go. Okay, so I'm going to prove this equality that we showed. Uh, so the sum of natural numbers from zero through to n uh, is equal to n times n plus one divided by two. So we're gonna do this proof live and it's gonna be checked by a computer at every step of the way. So remember, on paper when we verified this, the first thing that we did is uh, we did an inductive argument. So we did induction on n. So we're gonna do induction on n and because in mathematics, in the full power of mathematics, there's a large variety of inductions. Uh, here we're gonna just say that, okay, we're gonna use uh, natural induction. Okay, 
So now, once we do it natural induction, we can see so this is our proof state uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, we can see that we have two goals. So one is we need to show that the base case holds, and one is the inductive argument. So let's have a look at the base case now. Uh, here we need to sort of establish the base case. And the first thing that we did was is we unfolded the sum. So let's do that. And that reduces just to zero. Now we just need to handle the right-hand side. And in this case, we have we need to show that zero, we, we have this on the right-hand side, we have zero times by some expression. And we know that uh, someone else has proven uh, that um, okay, someone else has proven this statement, which is multiplied by zero is zero. So this statement, someone else has actually written down and proven by themselves, and they and it essentially asserts that for any n, n, zero times n is going to be equal to zero. So assuming that someone else has written this proof, we can now use it in our own, uh, and then when we rewrite it, we get uh, this. So this previous step reduces down to zero divided by two. Uh, now we can also use another fact. Um, and we can also use another, someone else has also proven, uh, okay, uh, someone else has also proven that dividing zero by anything is also going to be zero. And now we have this simple equality, zero equals zero. And this holds, uh, this holds by reflexivity because equality is a reflexive uh, relation. Okay, now let's look at the inductive step. Um, so now we have the slightly more complex um, case. Remember, in our pen and paper proof, the first thing we did was we unfolded the summation, and in this case, we unfold it to n plus one and the remainder of uh, and the sum from zero to n. Again, we notice that this matches exactly our induction hypothesis, so we're going to rewrite this equation using the induction hypothesis. Now we have this simpler statement here. Uh, now we're going to bring both um, both terms on, of this summation under the same. Uh, denominator dividing by two, and we're just going to do this uh, by rewriting using the distributivity of division over sum. Okay, um, and then some subgroup. Okay, so now we brought we multiplied by two, and we brought it under the same numerator. At this point, both sides of the equation are being divided by two, so we can simplify equality. Um, and now we have this simpler equation where we've, removed, we've canceled out the division by two. Uh, now we're going to rewrite using the commutativity of multiplication. Uh, so we're going to split that to the side. Um, and we're going to rewrite using the... Uh, di so now notice that here we have two times n plus one plus n times n plus one. So we're going to, again, factor out this n plus one uh, of... Over, so we're going to uh, rewrite using the distributive of the multiplication over sum, and now this factors out this n plus one. Uh, now notice, uh, okay. Now we're going to rewrite we're going to rewrite the commutativity of multiplication here again. Now notice we have this equality where we have n plus one times two plus n equals n plus one times n plus one plus one. So both sides of the equation are being multiplied by um, by n plus one. So we can simplify the equality again, and now we have a simple equation that. Uh, 2 plus n equals n plus 1 plus 1. And this holds by arithmetic. Uh, let's see. Okay. And then that, with this, we've completed our proof. Uh, so to that, with this, we have established the statement that we uh, started off at the start, uh, that the sum of natural numbers equals the following equation. And that is an example of a computer proof. Thank you. Uh, okay. okay. Uh, didn't fail, so we can move on. Okay, so mathematicians are human, and to err is human. So the question we asked is, can we use computers to help? And what I've showed you here is that yes, yes, we can. Uh, we can write computerized proofs that are checked by a computer and don't have these mistakes. And this is kind of exactly what we did. So we took a data structure known as a Bloom filter. You may have sort of encountered it. This is kind of a probabilistic data structure uh, that provides a sort of set-like interface. Um, it was a sort of introduced by Howard Bloom uh, in 1970, and he kind of uh, introduced it and analyzed the probabilistic properties of this data structure in his original paper. So uh, it's actually quite, once it was introduced, it's actually been quite popular. It's widely used in sort of uh, web browsers and databases. So probably if you've uh, used a browser or, uh, you know, to access a website any time uh, recently, then you've probably used a Bloom filter at some point in your uh, computer, um, so that's quite popular. But the only problem is 
the textbook proof is actually wrong. Um, so this was actually identified by some other researchers, maybe sort of 20 to 30 years after uh, Howard's original, uh, Bloom's original proof. Um, but then this correction was also itself uh, wrong. So they had some mistakes in it as well. And that was I later identified. Uh, so, so clearly there's been a long history of kind of errors in this area. And what we did is we sort of sat down and we took the Bloom filter and we embedded it into a, ver uh, into a verification assistant like the one I just showed you in the demo. And we verified the properties of a Bloom filter uh, using this sort of rigorous way. Uh, so we could establish what the properties are once and for all without any kind of possibility of errors creeping in. And this was then later sort of published. And as an added bonus, uh, our names were actually included. So this is a little task for you if you want. Uh, if you go to the Bloom filter Wikipedia page and search for Gopin Nathan, uh, there will be a little reference to me uh, there. So that's that's nice uh, recognition. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's that's that. Okay, so uh, final final one. What PL can do for you? Number three is uh, impact. So programming languages research can have real impact and really change the way different people uh, you sort of uh, interact with the world. Um, and this is our case study here is developing tools, IDE tools used by some developers. Um, so, you know, a programming language is really made or broken by the quality of its editor support. Um, and different, so editors like Emacs or Vim. Um, so different language features in uh, programming languages actually make editing easier or more challenging. So for example, something like Rust's borrow checker makes certain transformations that you might have uh, assumed were fairly simple actually quite difficult. Um, and the goal of sort of programming languages researchers is to kind of investigate this uh, problem space and develop tools to handle the various features of complicated programming languages. Um, and yeah, programming languages research is perfectly suited to solve this particular problem. Uh, so our case study in this case is two IDE developments that we've done at Verslab uh, for sort of hot programming languages uh, used by sort of many developers. Um, so one is we've recently implemented uh, sort of a, a tool, uh, some research work that actually implements extract method for Rust. So this was some work done in combination with uh, Suwen, who's an uh, undergrad from Yale and US. And what we did is we implemented uh, a sort of, uh, we extended the IntelliJ editor to add support for extracting methods. And the problem is that uh, if you naively extract, a, extract an expression from a, a Rust function, then it could be that the extracted function doesn't have the appropriate sort of lifetime and uh, ownership constraints to actually make the code type check. And this, this can be quite annoying and actually limits the development of Rust quite a bit because you can't really easily change your code. Um, the other project we did was implemented structural navigation for the OCaml programming language. So OCaml doesn't really have any clear lexical denoters of sort of starting and ending scopes. There are no like braces. So it's very hard to do transformations like start, select the start and the end of this uh, expression by its braces. Um, and so we developed the first structural navigation sort of tool for um, OCaml. And OCaml is a sort of language. And, and in theory, these are used by developers at very large companies like Jane Street or Aris, as we've, uh, as we've heard from previously. Um, <clears throat> Okay, and so uh, you know the the projects have been released online. They've had some uh, some success. Uh, I get I hear feedback from developers a lot about uh, the tools that they use, and uh, well, it's mostly pestering about bug reports, which I've been uh, putting off for years. Um, <laughs> but uh, also the uh, the Rust refactoring was actually then wrapped up into a project that we actually uh, published, um, which is actually to be presented next uh, week as well. Uh, so have, have a look at that paper if you have the chance as well. Uh, okay, so uh, you know this is a fairly high level one, so I'm just going to show you a brief live demo. This this one, uh, oh yeah, okay, actually, it'd be good if you can hold it as well. Uh, this one's going to be fairly short, so don't worry. Um, okay, so I'm just going to show you. Uh, so this is this is the uh, editor sub, uh, plugin. It's called Got Camel Mode, um, and it supports sort of very structural transformations for a Camel code. This uh, this re relied on some programming language theory like uh, zippers and such to allow for tran uh, sort of trans transforming and iterating through the AST. Um, so here are some sort of features of uh, got camel mode, um, but let us actually see it live. So um, here we go. Uh, the, the features that got camel mode supports are this kind of structural movement. So you can kind of traverse through the structure of a program in a way that's actually very faithful to how the compiler sees these expressions. Um, so that's quite nice, and that's convenient for editing the camel code. 
Uh, it's also convenient because it allows you to do structural transformation. So you can do something like moving expressions up and down. Uh, and this, if you think about it, like trying to do it by hand would be quite difficult. Um, and finally, and this is a particular problem in OCaml because there aren't sort of clear denoters of start and end of sequences. So in theory, I could even put this statement here, and then uh, you couldn't even just sort of change the lines. Uh, but with GopCamel mode, you can just sort of shift them around uh, like so without any problem. Um, and the final feature that I'm going to show is we also have some kind of extract expression. Uh, so we can extract this expression. Hopefully it works. Yay. Um, expression. Uh, OK, that's not going to compile, but you get the point. Um, yes, OK, that's, that's the demo. Uh, it's a very short demo, but uh, hopefully it gives you an idea of kind of the things that you can do with programming languages. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so now I can get on. Oh, did tell. Okay, so now let's kind of wrap up now. Uh, what can programming languages research uh, do for you? That's the question that I asked at the start of this talk. And I said, well, the coolest aspects of PL for me are the following. Firstly, it's fun, and to sort of uh, demonstrate that, we looked at implementing a game in the experimental rhombus programming language. The game looks pretty fun. Um, for recognition, we looked at correcting bad maths with, com uh, with computer proofs, and we verified a Bloom filter. And finally, for impact, we looked at developing PL tools used by developers. And I showed you a couple of uh, tools that we've built. Um, so those are the reasons, but here are a couple of additional ones if you're not quite convinced. Um, so some more fun stuff is, well, if you're doing research, then you get to travel around. Um, so this is the world, and this is the places I've been. Um, so, you know, some, some places around there, here and there. Um, and also you get to meet new people, uh, so that's always great. So uh, here are some photos. So this is um, in, uh, this is New Zealand. Uh, this is in Ljubljana, and I'm standing next to here uh, okay, the pointer doesn't really work, but the person standing next to me is the creator of OCaml, um, Xavier Leroy. And uh, here I am next to, so there's Simon Peyton Jones and a few of the members from our lab, whom you may have seen in the crowd. Um, here I am in Germany. Uh, here, this is in Portugal. And this is in San Diego with some uh, seals, although they're quite dangerous, so don't go there. Um, so maybe the real PL was the friends that we made along the way. Uh, Okay, so that's, that's kind of, that kind of wraps up my talk. Uh, but if any of this interested you, then I want to remind you that you know, I want you all to do PL research. I think you all have something to contribute, and you'd all have something to gain from doing PL research. And so I just want to flash up some possible project ideas of working at uh, VersaLab that you, you might be interested in uh, if you want to join. Uh, so things like we're working on verifying deep learning for uh, tensor libraries. Uh, using sort of the mathematics that we've seen before. We're looking at sort of automatically fixing racket macros, like the macro systems that we've seen. And we're also looking at using sort of Rust compiler features of the borrow checker to establish sort of correctness of uh, programs in more complicated ways. Um, so if you're interested, just search Verslab NUS and you'll, you'll, find, uh, you'll find the web page. And feel free to send an email to either me or uh, my advisor earlier. Uh, we'd be happy to uh, you know, get in touch. Okay, so thank you for listening. That concludes my talk. And um, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, yes. Yeah, uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Thank you. I have two questions. Um, so the first thing is that what I, the impression I get from FP languages or FP inspired languages is that because of properties like immutability and operational transparency, there's this, it's kind of closer to the sort of mathematical theoretical side that actually make it easier to prove my correctness. Um, so uh, I just want to think about uh, if you know about techniques of automatic proof generation for, let's say, OCaml or Haskell programs. And the second thing I wanted to ask about is how much, in peer research, how much focus is there on performance? So for example, when I do it, okay, more has gone, my impression is that with lists, so not the like, static or something like, like populist normal lists, they're linked lists, and the linked lists are the problem of cache and guarantee, right? So um, like, I'm, I'm wondering like, 
Is there a lot of work on you know performance optimization, performance engineering, and that piece of it? Yep, uh, thank, thank you for the question. Okay, so I guess just to repeat the question here. Um, so the first one was, is, uh, so functional languages have features like, such as referential transparency um, that, and purity that make it sort of, that, that should in theory make it easier to prove. So has there been work on sort of automatically verifying these? Um, and yes, there's quite a bit of work in PL about how to, how to use these features. So I, I should sort of put the caveat here that Referential transparency and purity is really kind of Haskell propaganda. That's kind of a Haskell one. OCaml has a lot of mutability. Um, and so Haskell is kind of very opinionated about not having any effects, even though kind of, uh, you know, it has divergent computations and it has exceptions, so that's really a lie. Uh, but it gives the allure of that. Um, and, and people have done a lot of work. So uh, there's actually a quite, uh, so the, I, I don't have time to go into it here, but there is quite a nice uh, relation between uh, types and programming uh, and proofs themselves. Um, you can look up the Curry Howard correspondence if you if you want to look into that. In terms of actually verifying these programs, there have been a number of attempts at sort of um, constructing sort of verified um, implementations. So there's this thing called Liquid Haskell, which kind of extends Haskell's type system with the ability to state assertions about your specifications for your programs and saying like, okay, my input is going to be a natural number and my output is going to be a number greater than or divisible by three. And so you can assert these more sort of complicated pro properties about your programs. With regards to uh, performance, yes, a lot of work is done in the PL community about performance. Um, so uh, you can think about things like people look at uh, how to make garbage collectors faster. Um, you, a lot of the Jane Street people and people like, uh, like at RFs kind of look at how to make um, the features of OCaml sort of uh, how to use features of programming languages to make them more efficient. So there are things like making sure things are allocated on the stack versus on the heap. Uh, indeed, you're right that sort of lists and the way of representing lists isn't efficient. But the thing is that for the majority of programming tasks, you don't need that much efficiency. And in the cases where you do, then you can sort of uh, spend some time using a slightly less ergonomic structure uh, to, to implement sort of your more complicated, uh, complicated uh, sort of programs, right? So you can use an array in the case where you need that. Um, of course, there are some limitations, but there's a lot of research done into how we can branch between them. So Rust, for example, was an offshoot of some part of programming languages theory. It sort of came from initial uh, research into how to use uh, sort of like Cyclone C, how to extend C with uh, ownership and regions, uh, and then that eventually culminated in Rust. Uh, so, so, so there is a lot of research, and I'd, be, uh, I'd love to t speak to you about this more, I guess, after the talk. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I know. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, just wanted to ask, what is your favorite programming language and why? <laughs> oh, that's uh, that's a tough question because there are so many good ones. So you know, how can how can I just pick one? Uh, I program a lot in sort of OCaml, so uh, OCaml, but I've recently been doing a lot of Racket. So for example, I, I guess I'll I'll use this opportunity to show you that uh, the slides that I presented are actually uh, all in. Um, in Racket, so if I go to sort of like title, um, yeah, you can see that actually the title slide is actually some a big Racket program, a lot of S expressions. Um, so yeah, Racket is pretty cool too. You can build a presentation like this, uh, not not in like PowerPoint or Google Slides. It's actually code that I can transform. Uh, so that that's pretty cool as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so from, from like the functional programming programming language research uh, in that space, a lot of, a lot of research involves category theory, but I see that your talk is more like practical kind of um, programming language research. So just curious, how much category theory do you use in your work? Mm. So, so I guess, um, okay, the question was, uh, you know, there's a lot of functional programming research has category theory. A lot of my, uh, what I presented here was more practical, of practical bent. Um, yeah, that, that's true. I guess uh, we, we do a variety of research in the lab. Uh, some of my research tends to be more practical, although uh, for, for presentation purposes here, I cut down on the sort of underlying theory. So we do have a lot of stuff on uh, type, type theory uh, and such. Um, you are sitting maybe three species next to our homotopy type theory expert, uh, or over there. Um, so he, he can, he, he's the big category theory guy. I, I unfortunately don't uh, do that much. 
Uh, but, but we do do a variety of sort of more theoretical stuff as well. Yes, yeah. Thank you for the question. Any more? Oh. Hmm. Oh, okay, okay. So the question was, uh, what, what programming, uh, the opposite question to the earlier one, which is, which programming language do I not like? Um, you know, that's, that's also hard to say because, you know, a lot of programming languages have warts, uh, but the warts are also research opportunities. So, uh, you know, you could say that programming languages wouldn't, research, wouldn't exist without languages with uh, ugly faults and problems. So, uh, you know, I love all programming languages. They're all, uh, they're all great in their own little unique ways as little, you know, wonders of opportunities for research. Uh, yes? Hmm. No, even f funky thing. programming languages research is all about funky things, right? You want to do programming languages that do funky things is cool. Yeah. Uh, there's a question there. Do you mind giving a high-level introduction to how you implemented the structural engineering for the... Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so th thanks for the question. I guess, um, yeah, I guess I can't... Uh, so, so the highlight... Um, no, no, so, so I guess I can't really... Uh, I'll give you... Um, so if you want to find out, there's a, a video. There should be a video. Yeah. Okay. So there's a video on uh, there's a video on YouTube. We just said got camel mode uh, that that is 24 minutes, uh, but that has me presenting. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to play it here, of course. Um, but the high level idea is um, the way it works is we take the current text of the buffer, we feed it into the parser of the uh, the compiler of the compiler, and that gives us the AST, and then we trans when then we use a zipper. Uh, which is a functional data structure that allows kind of uh, iteration over trees in um, fancy ways. Um, and we use that to kind of uh, highlight the current sort of AST node that the user is visiting. So then when you go up and down, it's kind of it zipper operations. And these are kind of functional, pure transformations that are very nice and can be reasoned about um, theoretically if you want to. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, you know, I said every, every language is beautiful. Um, I guess some esoteric, there are esoteric languages that are uh, introduced to kind of have, uh, you know, explore the design space. Um, yeah, I think that's, it's, it has its uh, beauty. There are also sort of other esoteric programming languages. So, so it, it has its elegance. It's uh, kind of very simple, like Turing machine-like implementation. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, there are also programming languages that actually play with this idea of ASCII art as well a bit more and then you have programming languages where kind of um, the semantics are described as uh, the, eva the execution counter kind of traverses over the program and symbols kind of change the direction in which it traverses. Um, so, so, you know, to answer your question, uh, I think I, I, I don't mind. I like it. It's interesting and it spawned new uh, things. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, thank you for the exciting talk. You're welcome. I would like to ask, what do you think is the biggest achievement of the lab, the, the most important project, possibly? Or name at least some of them. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. Uh, because you know there's so many achievements, um, you know research is only. Oh, okay, okay. So one, the, the the research development that appeals to me the most. Yes. Mm. That's really that's okay. So I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say. Um, I, okay, yeah, yeah. I'd say I'd say the most beautiful idea that I've seen in computer science overall, not just PL, is the uh, Curry Howard correspondence. I think that that's really a really elegant. 
That's a really elegant uh, application of sort of type theory and mathematics, and really forms the foundation of a lot of um, you know automated and mechanized mathematics and verification that's done today. Uh, so if you do anything from this talk, uh, apart from signing up and sending us an email, you should also look up the Curry Howard correspondence. It's uh, very beautiful. Uh, so yeah, thank you for the question. I should sort of as a caveat, this is a, someone from the lab, so. <laughs> Okay, could you share a bit more about your experience formalizing Bloom filters in Corp? Because from, from my experience, formalizing um, stuff is quite tedious, so I'm actually quite impressed that you were able to do some non-trivial stuff with it. Mm. Yeah, yeah, so, so actually, the, the, that, thank you for the question. The question is, can you share some more experience about formalizing Bloom filters in Corp? Uh, thank you for the question. That's that's actually quite uh, yeah. You're right. It is quite tedious. Uh, it was quite painful. Uh, what what made it slightly more painful, and I think if you go into the version commit history of the Git, of the Wikipedia page, you might see this, uh, is that actually at the time when I started, um, uh, the time when I started formalization, which was this, um, yeah, uh, when I started formalization, which is maybe sort of uh, four four years ago, um, actually uh, the the proof about the correctness, yes, this proof about correctness was actually incorrect. So I spent maybe two months trying to prove an incorrect theorem, um, and that, that was not fun. Um, yeah, and then, so then, uh, and actually, the, the, it was actually quite a laborious process getting this out, because we verified it once, um, but we, we kind of axiomatized some parts of it. We, we sort of assumed certain things, and the first time we published it, it turns out one of our assumptions was wrong because we used the paper that found the error, but they also were wrong. So one of the assumptions was the thing that they, they made it, they did it incorrectly as well. Um, and so then the reviewer found that out. And the nice thing about when you mechanize mathematics is if a reviewer thinks your proof is wrong, they can just simply prove false. And that's what they did. So they, our, their review was mostly just, oh, we proved false. And they gave a text file showing how they proved false using our assumptions. Uh, and then we couldn't really argue with that. So we went back and we verified, uh, and then we found the error and we went back and verified it uh, from scratch. Uh, but yeah, yes, you're right. This is a very tedious process. Uh, and we do actually do research on how to make this easier. So we, we do some work into uh, proof maintenance. So our recent, most recent publication was something about how can we automatically repair proofs uh, to make things easier. But yes, yeah, uh, it is laborious. Uh, PL research looks into how to make mechanized mathematics easier. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Oh, yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so, so the question was, can I use, sort of, can I take the approach of mechanized mathematics as a process to learn mathematics? Um, yes, I think so, I, I think that's possible. Um, I guess it's hard, uh, so mechanized mathematics has a, it's di they're, they're sort, of, sort of more theoretical reasons why they're different, so um, me typically uh, mechanized mathematics form, uh, uses sort of a constructive logic uh, this is kind of very technical detail. So a lot of sort of textbook mathematics that you see in uh, introductory courses won't easily be converted to mechanized mathematics. Although kind of like people like the lean folks are doing stuff in that direction. So I, I guess one good place to look at is the lean documentation because they've actually gone through and mechanized a lot of the undergraduate curriculum for uh, the French sort of mathematics undergraduate degree. Um, so if you just step through that, you can go through the proofs. And maybe that's a good, I haven't tried it myself, but that might be a good way of uh, using mechanized mathematics to learn about mathematics itself. Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, hey. That's that's a hard question. So the question was, can you share a sort of aha moment where you had sort of eureka moment and discovered something? Um, so I mentioned the Curry Howard correspondence. Um, yeah, that's that's a, that's a tough question. Um, yeah, I, I'd say maybe an aha moment in this sense was actually um, 
not not so much an aha moment, but I, I guess these are hard to think, think of. Uh, but an aha moment, I guess, would be when I realized that the the proof of uh, my proof of bloom filters was not going through. Um, <laughs> two months in, um, uh, I guess it wasn't more an aha moment, more a I give up moment. But uh, <laughs> you know, uh, you you kind of look at a problem for a long time, and then finally you're like, oh wait, this this can't possibly be true. Uh, and I was like, aha, yeah, I wasted my life. <laughs> no, but uh, it was wasted two months at least. Uh, but yeah, there was a, it was that 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 I guess. Uh, but we have some more recent aha moments. But I can't really. Uh, I would suggest you look at our uh, work on. Um, or mostly automated proof of uh, for verified libraries, where we had this very nice correspondence with the Curry Howard correspondence about using that to repair proofs. Um, this is a quite a nice result. I'm quite proud of it. So uh, if you have the chance, do look at that paper. Um, I can, uh, if you talk to me after the talk, I can uh, recommend it. Thank you for the question. Yeah. Any more questions? Hey, thanks so much, Jerry, for the